Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna look at how you would carry out an experiment to determine the half-life of a radioactive source. So let's get started. For the National 5 Physics exam, you need to be able to describe an experiment to determine the half-life of a radioactive source. So we're going to look at this in the steps of a scientific report. So the aim for this experiment would simply be to determine the half-life of a radioactive source. So for the method, you would collect a geiger muller tube, counter, radioactive source, and a timer. You would then set up the equipment as shown below here. So you've got your counter measuring counts per second, your timer measuring seconds, your Geiger-Muller tube and your source. And in this example, we've got a source of protactinium-234. What you would do first, however, is you would take away this protactinium-234 source and you would measure the background count rate for 60 seconds. So that's the count rate when there is no source present. And we would do this for 60 seconds and we would get some total number of counts of background radiation. It then says to place the radioactive source next to the Geiger-Muller tube and record the count rate every 30 seconds for five minutes. Now this is just an example but you could do it every five seconds or every 10 seconds if you wanted to and you might not have to do it for as long as five minutes. The next section is the results section and let's say you've measured a background count rate of 42 counts in 60 seconds. So what we would need to do is get a value from that in counts per second and this is just the same as Becquerel's our measure of activity. So in this specific example I measured 42 counts of background radiation in the 60 seconds so if you want a value in counts per second we just divide 42 by 60 and we get a value of about 0.7 counts per second. We can then use the following to find the corrected count rate. So the corrected count rate would be the count rate minus the background count rate and the reason we're correcting the count rate is given here so it says the reason we must subtract the background count rate from our measurements is because the background count rate will differ depending on the location in which you carry out the experiment. For example, doing the same experiment in a school in Aberdeen, which is also known as Granite City, will potentially yield a slightly higher background count rate. So you don't want your results in the particular school and location that you're in to be different from another pupil's results in a school in a different location in Scotland. A table that you might want to sketch when you're doing the experiment would look something like this. So it says to create a table with columns for time, count rate and corrected count rate as shown below. Know that all of the readings and the background count rate have been rounded to the nearest whole number. So there's our time measured in seconds, going up in 30 second intervals up to 300 seconds because that's our five minutes. Our count rate was in counts per second and this was measured from the counter and our first value of 80 there is the value that was on the counter as soon as we started the stopwatch. You'll then see that activity is going down which is what we expect and so the count rate values are something you could input as you're waiting to reach every 30 seconds whereas the corrected count rate could be done after. You'll notice that the corrected count rate as well is just one value less than our count rate. The reason for that is we have taken our background count rate of 0.7 counts per second and we've rounded it up to the nearest whole number. So we've rounded that to one count per second. So all we've done there is we've subtracted our one count per second to get our corrected count rate in this column. That means we then have corrected count rate to plot on a graph. So it says plot a graph of activity, corrected count rate on the y-axis against time on the x-axis as shown below. If you do that, you should yield a graph that looks something like this. So you've got your corrected count rate in counts per second and your time in seconds. And so essentially this is just activity against time and we should always expect a graph which is an exponentially decaying curve when we've got activity against time for a radioactive source. So once you've plotted your individual points and your curve of best fit, we can then use the graphical method to determine the half-life of the source. So down here it says now use the graphical method to determine the half-life of the radioactive source. So if we do that, we're going from roughly 80 and halving that down to 40. We go along to our curve and then down and we've got our first chunk of time which is roughly 72 seconds. If we do that again, we would go from 40 and half it down to 20. We would then go along and down to our x-axis. And our second chunk of time, remember, goes from this point to this point, not from the origin to this point. So that chunk of time comes out as roughly 72 seconds in this specific example. And then the last half-life again, if we go from 20, half it down to 10, go along and down, we get another chunk of 72 seconds. So it's going to be pretty obvious what our average half-life is going to be because they're all the same. So in this case, our average half-life is 72 plus 72 plus 72 divided by 3, which gives us a value of 72 seconds for our average. So our conclusion then for this experiment is that from the graph, we can see the average half-life of the source is 72 seconds. 
This means that it takes 72 seconds for the activity of the source to decrease to half its original value, just using the definition of half-life here. That's all for this video folks, I hope you found it useful. If you did, give it one of these, subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.